Welcome to this IFRS Foundation podcast, which will focus on the February meeting of the International Accounting Standards Board. The meeting took place in London in the week of the 19th of February 2018. My name is Matt Tilling and I'm the Director of Education here at the Foundation. Today I'm joined as usual by the Chair of the Board, Hans Hugevost, and also with us is Board Member Daryl Scott. And we're going to talk through the latest meeting and other developments at the IFRS Foundation. Hans, let's start with those other developments. February was quite a busy month for the ISB, uh, starting with our trustees meeting in Hong Kong. Yes, um, as uh, many people know, we uh, meet with our trustees about three times a year. Uh, the trustees are the people who are responsible for the governance of our organization. And uh, our latest uh, trustee meeting was at the very start of February, and this time indeed in Hong Kong. We go to a different location uh, each time. Um, the ISB staff and, and, and board members updated the uh, trustees on, uh, on recent developments. And we also use these trustees meetings as an opportunity to meet with a wide range of stakeholders in the local market. Uh, this time we worked with the Hong Kong Institute for CPAs to organize a, a stakeholder um, event and uh, the theme was uh, the use of IFRS in uh, Hong Kong, past, present and future. We had a, a very good uh, panel discussion together with an investor, a market regulator and a company a, a preparer. The whole panel debate is available on our uh, website and on uh, YouTube uh, channel. Uh, it was an interesting debate in which we discussed, among others, uh, the relevance of our primary financial statement um, project, and many agreed that we agreed that it was very important for the board to give more structure to the primary financial statements, especially in relation to the. Uh, increasing digital consumption of financial information in the market by hedge funds, by other uh, investors, uh, and that for that reason you needed more structure in the uh, financial uh, information, in financial statements. So it was a very good opportunity to catch up with uh, a lot of people. Uh, Hong Kong is very uh, engaged, it was one of the first adopters of uh, IFRS in, uh, in, in, in the world and a big supporter um, of our uh, organization. Daryl, we also saw quite a bit of activity this month linked to the new insurance contracts standard IFRS 17. You're very close to this project, can you tell us a bit more about what's been happening? Sure Matt, so at the beginning of February, shortly after everybody came back from Hong Kong, we held our first technical meeting of the IFRS 17 Transition Resource Group. Now for, for those who are not familiar with the IFRS acronyms, this we commonly refer to as the TRG meetings. The TRG is essentially a forum in which we can bring together a group of experts to discuss issues in a public uh, setting so that others can share and understand their views. And in particular, the objective of this TRG is for us to discuss implementation issues as they arise uh, through the evolution of IFRS 17. Because of the focus on implementation issues, the um, forum is made up of preparers, companies, their auditors and, as observers, uh, regulators in this space. Um, we received 27 submissions from the insurance industry prior to this meeting. I think that was a really good turnout. It was a really good opportunity for us to understand what is emerging through the process of implementation. The idea is that we discussed most of the 27 at this first meeting. We have three further meetings planned for this year. Um, I think it's also worth saying that at the February board meeting, to the discussion we'll have in a few minutes' time, we discussed at a board level what the TRG discussions had found, went into some of the detail of some of the specific issues so that the whole of the board is aware of the TRG process and what the discussions are actually coming to. And we also spent a little bit of time talking about the other side of the equation because we haven't included users in the TRG process because they are not involved in implementation. But we think it's really important that from a board perspective, we balance what the board hears, both the preparer view and the user view. And the TRG is only one of a number of initiatives that we're undertaking to support the implementation of IFRS 17. Can you give me a quick summary of those other activities? Sure, Matt. 
So I think we've recognized through the process of developing and, and now publishing IFRS 17 that this is going to be a significant new standard for the industry. And as such, the implementation of it is likely to be challenging. So we've tried to develop a number of it is likely to be challenging. So we've tried to develop a number of different tools that uh, both preparers and others can use as they go through the implementation process. The first of these is a series of webinars, and in the webinars we've both tried to introduce IFRS 17 and then dive into a little bit of detail into some of the very specific issues that people are encountering as they apply the standard. We think that at a high level provides a nice easy introduction for everybody to get into the various parts of the standard and we're quite gratified to see those being picked up in a number of documents, quoted in a number of documents that are starting to come up around the standard. We're also participating in a number of conferences and organizing some of our own conferences, and there have been a couple over the last um, six months or so. In the next couple of months, we're going to be doing a conference on IFRS 17 in Malaysia, which we think, again, is an important opportunity to get into a different part of the world to have the discussion about 17. And then, as I mentioned earlier, educating users is a critical part of what we do at this stage. Over time, up on that element, they will start uh, involving themselves more in the education of users. But right now, getting into the process, getting users involved and having hearing from them is really important for us. For anybody who wants to have a look at a nice quick summary of this, we've just published an animation on our website and on um, social media. It's a nice quick two-minute introduction that leads you into the types of tools that are available and gives you an idea of what and where you can find them. Yeah, that's a really fun little anim animation that we've done and uh, I would encourage everyone to go and have a look at the website even if you don't think uh, IFRS 17 is something you, you particularly need to know about right at the moment. I wanted to start the discussion of this month's board meeting by looking at the Disclosure Initiative. An important part of any project is the feedback the board receives from various stakeholder groups. Yes, uh, so as part of the uh, Disclosure Initiative we published last year a discussion paper on what we call the Principles of uh, Disclosure. And this month we discussed the feedback that we received from our constituents around the world. And what was very remarkable is that we received almost opposite reactions from investors and preparers. We reached out to about 190 investors and analysts around the world to talk about this discussion paper. They told us there is not so much a problem of overload uh, of information, perhaps we get not enough uh, relevant um, information, uh, but certainly we don't see that there is a problem of overload. That was the main message we got from the investors. On the other hand, preparers uh, were largely of the opinion that the disclosure requirements in our standards are too extensive and that that leads to an overload of information, which they think is often not so relevant to investors, which is not what investors <laughs> tell us uh, themselves. Um, but where perhaps the minds between preparers and investors uh, meet, is that both say, well, we have to focus more on material, uh, material and relevant uh, information, uh, and that also users were concerned about ineffective communication of disclosures that may not be all that relevant. Um, well, uh, it, it is in that respect good that the board already did quite a lot of work with. We uh, recently issued the materiality practice statement, which, which should make it easier for preparers to decide which disclosures can should be uh, published because they are relevant and which uh, are not. And we have heard feedback from preparers that they do think it's very useful. Uh, we have also adjusted IAS 1 uh, to make it abundantly clear that immaterial information should not be included in the financial statements and also not in the are not asking for it. So hopefully uh, we will be able to find a position that meets the objectives of both groups, but it's going to be tough and there's still a lot of work to be done. Daryl, turning now to the discussion on primary financial statements, this month the focus was on the presentation of cash flows of integral and non-integral associates and joint ventures. Can you remind us a little bit about this concept of integral versus non-integral and then tell us about those discussions? Sure, Matt, and this is perhaps where one of those areas where the research that the ISB does in developing uh, the groundwork for um, new standards and new discussions becomes really important. So our research in the space has indicated that 
a number of users tend to think when they're doing their analysis differently about uh, associates and joint ventures depending on how those associates and joint ventures are used by the company. Those that are integral to the process are typically considered as part of those that are integral to the process are typically considered as part of the valuation of the business itself, whereas those that are non-integral, not part of the business, not a necessary requirement of the business, tend to be thought of as an investment type of um, a determination in the valuation process. So we've realized that in the development of the primary financial statements that we're talking about right now, it'll be important for us to think about how we treat these integral and non-integral associates and joint ventures. We've already discussed this at the previous meeting, and in that previous meeting we talked about what the definition of integral and non-integral was for the purposes of thinking about the statements of financial performance. In this meeting we went further with that discussion and talked about how we would deal with this in the cash flows. And we decided that the cash flows are an important additional element of information for users of financial statements. And so it was going to be important to split cash flows between those that are uh, back and forth from the integral operations and those integral operations and those that are back and forth from the non-integral operations. So the first tentative decision we made was that we thought that we should make that split at the cash flow space. The second decision that we discussed was whether or not we would use the same definition of integral and non-integral that we had applied for the statements of financial performance, and we believed it was appropriate to keep a consistent definition across both of those statements. And you also continued a discussion from the January meeting about the proposals for management performance measures. Yeah. So in, the, in this case, the staff presented us with a paper um, that was essentially discussing what the various merits were of presenting management performance measures and particularly about how much guidance we should put around those measures. Now the board in the course of the meeting discussed the balance, if you like, between the insight that you get when the management performance measure is left totally to the discretion of management against, on the other side, the potential for loss of information or perhaps obscuring of important information on this one. What we did was we asked the staff to go back and have a look at whether they could simplify the proposal for us to consider. Hans, the board looked at rate-regulated activities and continued its discussion of possible accounting models this month, but a key outcome of the discussions seems to be the agreement that we are talking about assets and liabilities under the new conceptual framework within this project. Yes, yeah, so the board is trying to develop a, an accounting model for rate regulation, um, and the focus of the model will be on the incremental rights and obligation that arise from timing differences created by a regulatory agreement. Let me try to explain. Uh, for example, a rate regulator uh, tells uh, an energy company to build a new plant in the current year. And then it says, well, the question is, you can finance that plant by an increased charge on your customers in the following three years. So that, that's how you will get your money uh, back. And then the question is, if the company has built that plant and has fulfilled its performance obligation vis-a-vis -vis the rate regulator, is there an asset? Is the future stream of payments that they will get to cover the costs of that plant, is that an asset or not? Uh, and we tested that model uh, with a new, um, more precise definition of assets and liabilities in our new conceptual framework. And in this meeting, we came to the conclusion, yes, these are assets and these are liabilities in principle. Uh, which was a very important breakthrough uh, for this uh, project because uh, that was one question that the board was not s sure of until uh, now. We now feel sufficiently confident that we can go on with this can go on with this model. So uh, a major breakthrough. Daryl, you also discussed the business combinations under Common Control Research Project. Yes, we discussed a paper at um, the February board meeting which contrasted the existing requirements under IFRS 3 for what's called the acquisition method with what's happening in practice at the moment in terms of the way companies have actually applied business combination accounting when they're dealing with common control. Uh, the paper made it clear that currently there's very mixed practice um, in, in, the, in the outside world, that companies are doing very different things in this space. 
And the board was asked where we should start this project from, what the beginning point should actually be. And what the board decided was that we should start with IFRS 3 acquisition accounting, we should start with the existing codified, if you like, accounting approach, and then develop our uh, solution for common control from that starting point. There was a lot of discussion in the board about what that, act that actually meant mm -hmm. and whether that meant or implied that we would need to, that, that we were going to end up with acquisition accounting. And I think both the board members at the meeting and the staff during the course of the meeting were at pains to stress that this is a starting point for us to consider from a platform basis, but it does not mean or suggest that we're likely to end up with a solution that is in part or even at all acquisition accounting. But we think it's important to start from what we know is existing codified practice rather than from any of the myriad different solutions that are out there at the moment. Hans, finally you also looked at the research pipeline. Now these are projects that are not currently on the work plan but depending on the outcome of the research phase they could become standard setting projects. Yes, so after our latest agenda consultation we made a whole list of projects that we thought uh, were important uh, and should be dealt with in the next five years. Obviously we couldn't start working on all those projects at the same time and so we put a couple of those projects in what we call the pipeline. Uh, we're going to do it but at the time when resources become available and we finished other standards. Obviously some standards uh, have been finished now, um, insurance, uh, we have still a lot of people working on insurance but fewer than in the past. Conceptual framework is uh, finished, will be published uh, uh, by the end of this uh, month. So uh, people become available there too. So we thought it wise to start thinking about what uh, can we uh, start working on now. I don't want to get into the detail. People can uh, look at the website on at the update and, and see the more uh, detailed decisions that we've taken. But I'd like to focus on uh, one area where uh, we are will start working on, which is extractive activities. Uh, we, at the moment, don't have a proper uh, standard uh, for that activity. Uh, mining industry is extremely important in many parts of the, uh, of the world. Uh, and we've decided that we um, will start asking um, national standard setters who, uh, whose staff contribute to a discussion paper that was produced in 2010, uh, which outlined the problems with existing standards and possible routes to, to change them. We will ask them for an update of that uh, uh, discussion paper and then uh, the board can start uh, working on that. So I think that's an important uh, new uh, line of work. Well, that brings us to the end of the board meeting. Hans, is there anything else that you'd like to tell us about? Well, we had a very good meeting um, earlier this week with the uh, IFRS Advisory uh, Council. The Advisory Council is an important group of people of almost 50 representatives uh, from a wide range of stakeholder groups and geographies. And um, Advisory Council provides uh, a lot of strategic input to both the trustees and our board. I must say we meet twice a year now, uh, always very lively meetings, um, not just good because we get a lot of useful uh, advice, but also because these are all uh, constituents are extremely supportive of the uh, IFRS Foundation and our work. So it's always a very refreshing uh, event and uh, we enjoyed it uh, very much again. I'd also like to mention that registration for our flagship conference in Europe is now open. This year the conference will take place in Frankfurt at the end of June. More details are available online. That brings us to the end of the February podcast. Thank you to Hans and to Daryl and as always thank you to you our listeners. For those of you who aren't aware we have also started posting these podcasts to our YouTube channel. You can find it by searching for the IFIFRS Foundation in the YouTube app. Any feedback on these podcasts, please email communications at ifrs.org. The full summary of the board's discussion and decisions at the February meeting can be found in the ISB update on the IFRS Foundation's website. Thank you very much.